this is not what we do. <laughs> this part of the conference is entitled The Onion Pioneers, a title which Robert and I did not choose. It does not sit very well with two modest chaps like Robert and I. The true pioneers were Robert's father, my uncle, the late, great Gilbert Aldershaw, along with Arthur Whitlock, George LeMay, Roger Balls, Dr. Mike Shipway, David Harrison, and of course, last but not least, a certain Mr. David E. O'Connor, who honed the technique which we all use to grow, harvest, and store onions. Um, but before that, a little bit about ourselves. Our company was founded by the two look good looking fellows you see on the screen. On the left, my father, and on the right, my uncle Henry. Prior to leaving school at 14, the father, along with his elder brother, kept chickens and pigs. And later, while em whilst employed by J. Warden Sons as farm labourers on their Malton farm, the size of their operation expanded. Father always thought big and he once built himself a large wheelbarrow, as a standard one wasn't big enough for him. <laughs> Unfortunately, he didn't heed the advice that uh, he often gave to me, which was measure twice, boy, and cut once, resulting in, in them having to take the door off the shed to get the wheelbarrow outside. <laughs> During the war years, their first venture into the onion industry was a, a one-acre crop of onions grown on an, an allotment in Malton next to the family small holding. In 1948, they purchased a small piece of land, which was about eight acres down Long Lane, where the NBC Packhouse now stands. Initially, they grew daffodils, tulips, and peonies, and they built glass houses for early production. The picture, the picture of tulips was uh, Rose Copeland growing at Pinchbeck West, and this is a crop of uh, golden harvest in the glasshouse at Malton. Bulb and flower production, which was very profitable at the time, allowed, with a lot of hard work, allowed expansion. Ten years on, they were farming 150 acres, and by the mid-70s, mid we were growing 50 acres of daffodils, 24 acres of tulips. Um, we had half an acre of glass at Malton, and uh, the farm had grown to about 600 acres at that time. Um, this is the site at Malton, which some of you may have visited. Uh, it looks a little different now, but obviously glass houses is there for the flower production. Always looking for the next new challenge. In 1967, Gilbert, in conjunction with a local builder and carpenter, built our first prepack machine to put bunch tulips into branded polythene sleeves for the wholesale market. The machine was basically made of, of hardwood with a few metal parts, a second-hand motorbike gearbox and a second-hand electric motor. The uh, sleeves were put onto the cups by hand, blown open with a, uh, a Hoover cleaning machine and the, uh, uh, and the the bunches were then put into the, uh, into the open sleeves. The two ladies on the left are putting tulips in, and the handsome young man at the back is yours truly packing said tulips into cardboard boxes. Unfortunately, this was a case of being just a little bit too soon to the market. It was probably another 20 years before this became the norm. We now fast forward to, uh, to 1967, when we started growing onions for the second time. The reason for this nearly new enterprise was that flower production was an 11 month cycle and there was little going on in October. And with 11 full time staff on the nursery side, the plan was to grade and market onions during this month. The first crop was stored in an extremely conventional way using chitting trays. Um, for the younger members of the audience, um, these are containers which are used to promote early growth on potato seed, but they were also used to store onions. You. 
Initially, onions were grown in a very traditional way and cured as nature intended. The second year, forced air was introduced into a building which had above floor laterals, a duct made out of redundant prefabricated bungalow floors, and heat raised using an unreliable New Way Benson diesel oil-fired glasshouse heater. This resulted in fumes and smoke being drawn into the intake fan and obviously blown through the crop, which we believe not only enhanced the flavour, but also added colour. <laughs> As can be, it can be seen oh, from sorry. this picture, windrowing was in its infancy. And this machine is a Massey Ferguson steerage hoe with bars welded under the undercutting hose and with sufficient forward speed a windrow of sorts could be achieved. And as also can be seen from this picture, topping at this point hadn't been invented. Um, I think at this time we had three ton petty carts pulled by Massey Ferguson 135s and Nuffields and untopped onions bulk up ever so quickly. Um, which resulted in yours truly, just 16, no licence, carting onions from Fosdyke to Moulton up the A17, using a Massey Ferguson 135 and a petty cart. Imagine that today. The crop was loaded using a Whitstead duplex potato harvester and taken to store where the poor unfortunate tractor driver had up the unenviable task of getting the onions out of the trailer and into the elevator. This was generally achieved by a, a craftsman, in brackets, father, made wooden rake, which guaranteed extremely sore hands and stomach muscles. We now fast forward to 1974, at which time Gilbert was approached by Arthur Whitlock from ADAS, the Horticultural Experimental Station at Curtin at that time. ADAS had been tasked with the job of improving the UK onion industry, which at that time was not much more than a market garden enterprise, producing decidedly class two and class three grade onions to rival the Dutch. <laughs> the project set out to change that and to rival the Spanish and produce nice golden brown onions with eye appeal and hopefully reduce imports. The intention was to direct harvest a small quantity of our crop by machine topping in the field, wind rowing and allowing to dry and then loading into store with a curing, where a curing protocol was laid down, i.e. blow as much hot air as possible for as long as possible until dry. After what had gone before, this new harvesting method worked marvellously. And Gilbert made the decision, much to the horror of ADAS, that we should harvest the whole 20 acre of crop in this way. This proved a, a great success, despite the target temperature of 30 never being reached, and the store being grossly overloaded at all times. It shouldn't be forgotten that this was before swift lift elevators, and tong hoppers to remove debris. So the crop was going into the store only having passed over the massive cleaning area of a Whitstead harvester. The, unfortunately, the, uh, the first high-tech topper that we used, um, there is no pictorial evidence. It was a, a David Brown forage harvester, which I think in the first year we used unadulterated. Um, in the second year, my father, in conjunction with, uh, with Roger Balls, who was the machinery expert at Curtin, decided that more suction was required to improve topping. Um, and they decided to fit a secondary fan in the hood of this forage harvester. Um, it worked brilliantly for about a chain, 20 metres for the younger audience, um, as it was picking up whole onions and throwing them several hundred feet, like, <laughs> like howitzer shells. The ones it left in the ground, it was topping really, really well. Um, but unfortunately, there was a, a very quickly a build-up of best silt, um, causing the fan to jam and the machine to digest itself. End of the first prototype. Um, from, from that time onwards, we, we, 
we've searched for the perfect topper, and I don't think we've nearly, really found it now, but um, we moved to a Wilder machine, um, which I converted in the farm workshop. Um, it had long and short tines to fit between the rows, and an auger from a Harry Beat harvester across the back to take out the tops. This was probably the most efficient topper that we've ever had, but it was pre-satellite steering and required an extremely talented tractor driver to operate it, else massive damage occurred to the crop. Um, during the intervening years, we've tried every topper known to man, I think. Um, one supposedly developed by a so-called engineering firm required 150 horsepower on a single, single row, single bed topper. Um, surprisingly, that didn't get past the development stage either. After the success of our commercial trial, Gilbert was approached by a gentleman called George LeMay, who was based in Nottingham and was an extremely big cheese in ADAS at that time, and asked him to host a development year at Moulton and try to show UK onion growers how ADAS were revolutionising the onion industry. A 30 prospective onion growers visited our site. 300. 300. 300, <laughs> 300 prospective <laughs> onion growers <laughs> visited our site and farm during the two development years. And it was suggested that in year one, there were only three people in the country who had tried direct harvesting. And the following year, over 100 growers had taken this up, which amounted to nearly 60% of the onion acreage, we believe. We are a little hazy over the complete turn of events during the development years, perhaps because we were there, didn't record it, and didn't expect to be repeating it in 40 years' time. <laughs> but what we are sure about is that the last visit involved the UK trade, which included multiple buyers as well as people from the wholesale market. This resulted in one particular senior buyer from Marks & Spencer approaching HCC Tinsley's, one of their carrot suppliers and a larger farmer in Holbridge Marsh, and asking if they could supply these new, improved English onions. Tinsley's were not interested at that time in putting up another pack house, and asked if we would consider doing so using Tinsley and Aldershaw's onions to supply it. The success of this uh, commercial trial encouraged the building uh, in 1976 of the uh, gigantic purpose-built state-of-the-art onion store, which is the, the white roof building you can see in the picture. Um, it held about 1,200 tonnes well, when it was well overloaded. Um, at the end of it, there was a grading store, and then there was a, a at that time, we managed to put all the boxes under cover, so there was a box store on this end as well. Um, we think the store may have been built as a bulb store, as there was a certain amount of horticultural grant available at that time. Um, and it was also used to cure daffodil bulbs for a very short period. Well, that's our story anyway. <laughs> this store was unique in the fact that the heat was raised using the same hot water boiler as heated the glass houses. This is probably one of the better ways to cure onions, as hot water was pumped through a one million BTU heat exchanger, making the temperature infinitely controllable. But not something that anyone would contemplate today, unless you happen to have a large hot water boiler standing idle on site. This new store was pivotal to the production of the quality onions which resulted in Molten Bulb Company's packing business. As a slight aside, in 1980, um, David O'Connor was approached by a representative of the Dutch onion, onion industry who had, who had read about this approach to producing quality onions and was asked if they could come over and inspect our onions in store. A trip was duly organised and a busload of Dutchmen duly turned up and they learned all there was to know. Unfortunately, they didn't really grasp the fundamentals of curing onions, air flows, temperatures, etc., and David assures me that there were several stores that year which surprisingly didn't make class one. And of course, they've been trying to catch up ever since. <laughs> <coughs> you, 
you're supposed to quote diary. Thank you. Thank you, for the, thank you for the prompt. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my diary of 1976. I realise it's a little bit sad, but I'm pleased I kept it. <laughs> On Wednesday, the 17th of November, 1976, I recorded, riddled onions all day today, trade is good, Lambert Brothers returned £208 per tonne for 33.55s, and £220 a tonne for 55.70s we used printed nets for the first time. Malton Bull Company was initially set up in 1964 <coughs> with my uncle, my father, and a Dutch director by the name of Cornelius de Waard. Um, at that time, the rules were such that he could come over here and sell Dutch bulbs, but he couldn't sell our English bulbs. So this company was formed so that he could sell our bulbs at the same time as selling Dutch bulbs. Um, this was, of course, pre-EEC. For the younger members in the audience, EEC stood for a European Economic Community. Um, it only operated for a short time because th the rules very quickly changed. Um, NBC was put in the cupboard, and, uh, and it didn't see the light of day until 1979. Having worked hard to build up the farming operation, there was a reluctance to re risk the parent company in what was seen as a risky operation. So NBC became the packing arm and the total separate identity of the farm. Initially, we had two customers, Safeway and JS, and we're packing about 15 tonnes a week with three staff. This was an extremely lean operation with no requirements for a technical department, no HR department, no health and safety, and apparently unannounced BRC audits were unheard of. All of the pre-packed onions were marketed through Tinsley's sales office, and for that they took a very generous 7.5%. The good old days. Eventually, in 1992, it was insufficient margin for tin Tinsley's to continue to take a commission. And our biggest customer at that time made a difficult decision, very easy for us, by asking why he needed Tinsley's. The answer we were quick to point out was that he didn't, bless him. <laughs> Initially, back in 76, most of our onions were grown from seed. Um, but in the search for earliness and quality, especially on the silts, um, we went down the route of transplant. And I think it's safe to say I wouldn't be here today if we'd have continued with that trend because I would have retired 20 years ago. We also tried covering with polythene, which helped with emergence, it helped with earliness, <coughs> and it also promoted the most healthy chickweed I've ever seen. <laughs> um, along with transplants and polythene came onions grown from sets. Hallelujah. Um, and most of our early production now comes from, uh, from sets. Um, the picture on the screen, as I mentioned earlier, we've, managed, we've tried all manner of topping and windrowing. Um, this seemed like a good idea at the time. Topper on the front, window at the back. It never did really work. The topper was computer controlled, supposedly, or sensor controlled, but it very quickly ended up in the nettles. In the intervening years, in an attempt to keep the cost of production to an acceptable level, everything has got bigger and bigger. And just, not just in the field, but in the pack house too. Single bed machines have gone to triple bed. 12 meter sprayers have become 36 meters. Originally in our first pack house, we turned out 15 tons a week using mechanical weighers, lots of giveaway, and hand clipping machines. In 1986, now producing 90 tons a week with AFELT computer weighers replacing the mechanical weighers, and in an instance, reduce the giveaway from what could be up to 20% down to less than three when packed into nets. With our current equipment, giveaway is much improved again, thankfully, as today's margins would no longer allow a 3% giveaway. Um, I dropped that picture into the, uh, into the display. <laughs> um, 
it's obviously hand picking and it's not South Lincolnshire, but it, it could be Chile, um, it could be New Zealand, and of course it could be Norfolk. And, and of course, early production is not always about roses because sometimes it rains in South Lincolnshire as well. Um, storage has moved from chitting trays. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to go quick now. Yeah, it's the chitting from chitting trays. Um, Bulk storage outside. Um, believe it or not, that was taken in 1990. Um, it wasn't in an area of Lincolnshire, which I don't think they know the war's finished. But <laughs> there we go. Um, then into bulk stores inside, and then in the relentless quest for, for quality, into one-ton boxes and three-ton boxes. Um, in fact, one of the major growers in the UK uses 17 tonne boxes to cure and store. The storage regime has also changed a little with the advent of sophisticated store controllers, superseding the store managers, sensors, and not always with the desirable effect. I'm now able to sit at my desk and not just monitor the store, but control it as well. I mention humidity, relative humidity at this point, because I've never really understood it. And even with David's new equipment, it's still a problem for me to get my mind round. I mention it really because in the early days, it was suggested that 40% in the tunnel was too low and that we should try to raise it. Gilbert and I spent many fruitless hours with mains water, hose pipes, small electric pumps and sprayer nozzles to try to inject droplets of water into the fan. We only succeeded in flooding the tunnel, and this did not even raise the RH. In 1981, to enhance our packing business and to stop selling our rejects to the processors, we entered the processing world, supplying peel onions to most of the country's food manufacturers. Um, peaking in 2000, we were peeling about 200 tonnes a week. But times moved on and peeled onions started to arrive from Poland, well below our cost of production. By 2006, it was no longer viable for us to peel onions in the UK for food marketing manufacturers. We shut our factory, gave it a spruce up. Actually, we gutted it and created a chill factory with a high care facility and started to produce a retail packs but using our newly developed developed along with our partners, ERC in the Netherlands, a unique to the world robotic onion peeler is the one and only machine capable of peeling onions without human intervention. Like all good things, this took a while to develop, starting in 1998 and finally becoming commercially available in 2012. Along the way to complement this revolutionary machine in conjunction with our packaging supplier, we developed a film which greatly enhanced the shelf life of said product. Um, as, John started, as John said at the beginning, we never claimed to be the onion pioneers. That was Dave's description. Um, but Malton Bull Company has been involved with most of the major developments that um, have occurred over the last 40 years. Um, CA storage, which involved some awful fact-finding trips to the USA. Um, experimental work with Frank Adamiki in Poland, which involved John going to Poland for 15 years on the trot. He assured me it was essential. Um, 1997, the link mild onion pro production, which established that Spanish onions were not mild, something my father had stated to a journalist 20 years before during the open day. Ladies and gentlemen, I quote from a, the local press coverage of the, uh, of the third and final open day, entitled, Wholesale Prejudice Hits Onion Growers. And I quote, asked by Mr. Gilbert Oldershaw why there was a price difference, one wholesaler told him that Spanish onions and bread and cheese went well together. 
An English onion is just as good as a Spanish onion when it comes to eating it with cheese, Mr. Oldershaw said, as he had tried the Spanish and it was just as sharp tasting as the English. So we didn't need the mild onion project. Um, we were also involved with uh, the integrity of white rot control using onion compost, um, despite what everybody thought, putting onion waste back on the land um, actually cures white rot. And we've been successful in bringing land back into production, which previously was no longer viable. Um, 2000, we were the development work to explore the use of the ozone. 2001, the Sweet Onion Project started. Um, in 2003, the, the Super Sweet was introduced. And one of the industry luminaries, luminaries suggested at the time that this would take 60% of the bulb onion market in the UK within 10 years. Well, thank God he was wrong. Probably shouldn't say that in here, but... <laughs> um, we were involved with ethylene for storage and also the biosensor project. Um, that, ladies and gentlemen, is about it. Um, I put that one back up again. Um, and then the following one is the site as it stands nearly today. Um, you can see the, uh, the building that's going up, which is our three-ton box store, which was, has now been in use for four years, I think. So it's quite a long while ago. Um, and more developments going on at the moment. Um, so that's my father receiving his MBE, which he was extremely proud of. Um, I thank you for listening to us. And thank you for listening to and us. And that's it. <clears throat> but, but finally, ladies and gentlemen, before you rush off to lunch, we've got one more thing to do which is a presentation to someone who truly is the onion pioneer. This person has been the leading light, or at least part of almost every major development our industry has been involved in for, for nearly 40 years. It's been suggested from this conference onwards that he's going to start working part time, which we assume just means five days a week, <laughs> enabling him to spend a little more time working on his car collection. Vopa felt we should mark the last 40 years, and in all, although in no way is this a retirement gift, we hope he will accept this as a small token of the high esteem that the industry holds him in. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to ask David O'Connor to come on the stage, please. <clears throat> leave it for a moment. Okay. David, I make this presentation on behalf of BOPA. Having known you for almost 40 years, it is a, an honour, a pleasure and a privilege for me to do so. On behalf of all the membership of BOPA and indeed the entire onion industry, both here and worldwide. I'm sure they would all agree when I thank you for the enormous contribution that you have made to our industry and to wish you continued success, good health and happiness, be it in the extension of your career or in your eventual retirement. You, you have not got to open it now. You may wish to do so later. That is the, the content. I think this is a surprise to you. I'm sure it's a surprise to you. <laughs> but we still expect you to say yes, pause for 20 seconds, and then say a few words. <laughs> you may need the microphone. Well, I, I'm not often completely overcome and a complete loss for words. I'm known for uh, being perhaps um, seen as a bit slow on the uptake, you know. People ask me questions and I might uh, allow a few
few seconds or the odd minute or two to pass while I contemplate the best answer. But um, really, I, I don't know what to say because I just get up in the morning, you know, and do what I can. And um, same as everybody else, I guess. Um, you know, you, uh, you hope that um, the next week, the next year, somebody will soon be paying you. Uh, when I left um, ADAS, um, I can remember now piling my, the contents of my office into my uh, 1956 uh, Morris Minor, thinking this was the most stupid thing I'd ever done in my life. But uh, I have to say that I always wanted to run my own business, and although it was...